this is Mr. Smalley and I've made this tutorial in order to help you come a little bit closer to understanding uh, the phylum Platyhelminthes, which is our flatworms. Um, so this is sort of the tree of life. There's a lot of different um, facets of it. It's pretty darn complex. Um, and so far we've focused in on three different animals. That would be our phylum Periphera, phylum Nidaria, and phylum Platyhelminthes. Today we're going to look a little bit closer at the Platyhelminthes. Um, literally, the word Platyhelminthes translated means flatworm. So, there's four different things I'd like for you to know about all flatworms, um, and the first of which is their body plan. So, externally, uh, Platyhelminthes have what we call bilateral symmetry, which means that if you divide them straight down the middle, they should be the same on the right and the left. This is sort of the first, if we want to say that, time on the tree of life that we can actually see bilateral symmetry. Um, before this, in the periphera, we mainly have asymmetry, and in Nidaria, we have radial symmetry. They're circular. Um, this is sort of the first time we get to see that. Um, they're also flattened dorsoventrally, which means they're flat um, from the back side of their body and the front side. Uh, finally, they have cephalization, which means that they have a true spot on their body that's a head. Um, so let's take a little bit of a look also at internally what we find for these organisms. They're acelomate, which means that they have no body cavity. So as you look um, at this body cavity, there's the there's really no space, there's no air in it. Um, it's all thick the whole way through. Um, there's no coelom, that's why it's called acelomate. Um, they're also triploblastic, which means that there's three different body layers. The first body layer we would encounter if we came in from the outside would be called the ectoderm. Ecto means outside, Uh, so this is the outside, and then derm means skin. This is the outside skin. It's our ectoderm. Um, next we have a mesoderm. This is our middle skin. And finally, we have uh, what we call the endoderm, and that is... Uh, the inside skin. So this is our inside skin. Sorry, I'm a little sloppy there. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next thing we're looking at here. Next thing we've got is how they reproduce. So they have asexual reproduction that occurs by transverse fission. Fission means when uh, something splits apart. So if we look at this flatworm here, it's going to split apart in this um, zone of fission. It's the area where it splits. Um, that can form two new products, two new uh, babies, if you want to think about them like that. They're also sexual, and so they um, can produce both sperm and eggs, one individual can do that. That means they're um, hermaphroditic, and so they can mate with one another, and both worms could you know, swim away and uh, produce eggs that are fertilized. And so that's kind of, sort of a neat thing about this. Um, the fertilization occurs internally, and the offspring develop externally, and they actually have a larval stage. So some of these things, you'll find them um, in a cocoon, which is sort of interesting. Uh, next, how these things move. It's kind of neat to watch a planaria move around in a um, in a you know dish or something like that. So, how does that happen? Planaria move using cilia and muscular undulations. That means sort of these these waves that are going to move from the head 
uh, down to the tail. Um, they move through a mucus that aids in the adhesion and traction of the cilia. So mucus flows out of these little pores right here and it sort of makes like a slippery runway if you want to think about that for the um, planaria to crawl around on. So it's going to secrete all these um, this mucus that comes out. So they're really, really slimy when you catch these things. Um, you can find them under rocks in fresh water. And when you hold them, they crawl over you. They leave this slime trail, which is really as gross as it comes. But um, it's also kind of uh, cool. So if you're, if you think that way. Uh, let's move on real quick to how they feed. Um, unlike most animals that have uh, bilateral symmetry, their mouth isn't located at their head. Um, their mouth is located ventrally and it's incomplete, so it doesn't have an anus. Um, the mouth is actually found in the spot, it's called the pharynx, it's right in the center of these planaria, and it just digests the nutrition from whatever it can find, maybe that's dead fish or some rotting uh, organism, it's going to digest that throughout its entire body and the nutrients will simply diffuse um, from this central cavity um, out into all the tissue. So pretty much all the tissue is close to that central cavity where um, you can imagine sort of this nutrients or the sugars or something like that diffusing out of um, that digestive cavity into the rest of the tissue surrounding it. Um, again, they, re they feed through this retractable pharynx. Um, the pharynx is uh, sort of this kind of gross thing that comes uh, popping out of the center of their body when they feed. Now, there's going to be three um, types of platyhelminthes classes that I would like for you to know. There are more than these three classes, but these are the ones that you should know for this, this course. Turbellaria, uh, the turbellarians, sort of sounds like a family from Star Trek or something. Um, what these things are is they're um, free-living uh, worms, so they have cilia and they can um, move with those. So very small planaria will just use their cilia. Others use cilia as well as the slime that I spoke about earlier to move. Um, again, they'll use, uh, when, they, when they get a little bit larger, they'll use muscular contractions to move. Um, and examples would be planaria and marine flatworms. Next we have um, what are known as uh, the flukes, and the scientific name for this class is Trematoda. Um, and these are some pretty nasty creatures. So let's take a uh, look at some of them. This is a picture of a sea lion, and it has had a bad day because on the inside here you can see um, this right around here is a fluke or a trematode and it is sucking on to this poor creature's liver and it's actually causing it quite a bit of damage. Um, these trematodes can really um, hurt us. This is a trematode, it's called schistosoma and they live in places like rice paddies. Um, thankfully we don't have to worry about them too much in America. Um, but they'll crawl in to a human's foot and get inside their skin and cause these violent reactions and people have fevers and rashes. Um, what you're looking at here is actually a female. She's curled up on the inside, sort of like the inside of a burrito, if you want to think about that. So here's our female. Um, and she's all along the inside. Wrapped around her, again, so you can just see um, this is going to be our male. Again, this, this tiny inside part is the female. 
and he wraps himself around her and continually deposits uh, sperm and she will fertilize those and they just kind of stay alive inside of human bodies and um, are just these um, factories of um, viable eggs because they're just constantly mating. So it's kind of an odd arrangement, but um, it, it is working for them. So um, it's a pretty successful life plan. Um, so all trematodes are um, parasitic flukes. Most adults are endoparasites of vertebrates. The adaptions that they have for parasitism include penetration glands so that they can get into your tissue, glands to produce cyst material so that when they pass out of a um, host, they will be able to live, and they have hooks and suckers for adhesion, and they have this really high reproductive capacity so they can produce enough young to hopefully make it out of their host into another. The final group that we have is what I would consider to be the most disgusting. They're cestoda, or the tapeworms. Um, tapeworms are just about as, as gross as they come. Um, so they have a, a long, flat body. Um, the scolex is a holdfast head portion, and it has um, generally four suckers. And then it also is going to have these really, really nasty looking barb like hooks that come out and they cling on to your tissue. And um, you actually, it's, it's pretty challenging to get these out of you. Um, they're followed by a linear series of reproductive units or proglottids. This is a proglottid right here. Um, this is one following it. On the inside there, there is actually. Um, ovaries and uh, testes, so these individual units. Um, so each one of these things can actually produce millions and millions of eggs. So it's been reported that some of these things can produce as many eggs as there are humans alive on the planet, which is pretty fascinating. Um, so these things are, there's something to be reckoned with when they get inside you. Um, since they lack a digestive system, they absorb nutrients through the length of their whole bodies, and uh, consequently, the long they can get to be really, really long, and so they can grow up to be um, 60 feet inside of humans, and even 100 feet inside of a whale, which is just an astronomically long worm, if you think about that. Um, so uh, these things are really cool. They, they also have sort of a, a gross history. People were taking some of these proglottids out of here and they were putting them into tiny capsules or pills and then they would ingest these proglottids um, into their bodies and the proglottids would start to produce um, tons and tons of eggs all around their bodies and so these eggs are going to fill up and grow into long tapeworms and why would anybody ever do that? Well, maybe you can think about um, people who are trying to lose weight. If they're trying to lose weight and this tapeworm is sucking in all of their nutrients, um, well, they aren't going to be able to gain as much weight because the uh, tapeworms are going to take all their nutrients from them. So it's kind of a gross story. So uh, with that, um, We'll go ahead and close up this tutorial, and thank you very much for watching.